thank you everyone for coming and the virtual world. Um, you know, I'm very pleased to be here today to talk to Michelle about her project. And so, um, you know, I wanted to say, can you um, talk to a little bit where you're, you know, about your concept and kind of where it came from? Um, well, I suppose initially the concept was um, comes from my own experience um, of grief. Um, I my daughter died when she was 15. It was 17 years ago. And I suppose living with grief, it's something that um, it just becomes part of your life. But when I started doing this piece of work at the kind of initial stages, I was thinking about that I would actually park that a little bit to the side, my own experience. Now, it would inform me, of course. But then I was thinking about I was going to look at the sort of like the theoretical concept of grief. I was wrong. <laughs> um, so that was, I suppose, and in that I wanted to challenge the notion of closure because my, un my experience, I suppose, is that uh, people are loath to talk about grief a lot of the time. So there is a silencing, I think, when you are living through a grieving process. And, you know, it's just a discomfort people have. And I suppose I really wanted to blow that open and sort of say, I want to make work so that you can actually look at grief straight in the face. Okay, and you you came from a, um, in, I'd say not a traditional photographic mm. background, and so were there particular texts that you used in this research? Yeah, well, um, I'm only, I've only come to, I suppose I'm in photography in the very recent past, um, but I had a real desire to make, um, you know, I suppose I've, I've, I've done some writing and stuff, and I really just wanted to make something visual, but also text is my sort of like, it's my comfort zone, I think, really. And so um, there were a number of texts I um, looked at, but there was, I suppose, one of the things, and this is a book by um, Julian Barnes, which I can't read, but I can just about read now. Um, and uh, this text really sort of struck me, and it said about grief, you don't come out of it like a train coming out of a tunnel bursting through the downs and into the sunshine. You come out of it like a gull comes out of an oil slick. You are tarred and feathered for life. And I think that that's... Go ahead and push that little next button, because well, so everybody can see it. Oh, sorry. It's okay. Oh, sorry. That's what there I'm here for. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. here to... Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, guidance. Okay. So um, that was something that, I suppose, that really struck me, because it is... Um, it is, it is something that you will carry for your life. And then I had been um, reading, in another context, I had been reading a work by Judith Butler, who I really like, mm -hmm. and she wrote a really interesting book about um, mourning and grief after 9-11 in America. Mm -hmm. And um, even though it was sort of collective grief and collective mourning was her topic, but she actually did say this, and she was talking about attachment, and uh, it says, um, just to quote her, she said... Uh, my attachment is part of what comprises who I am. If I lose you, not only do I mourn the loss, but I become inscrutable to myself. And who am I without you? And for me, that was a really interesting question, which I hadn't actually considered until I read this piece of work. And I think making this work has been um, the revelation to me of my own identity uh, as an artist. Um, and I think that, you know, you're, you know, when you are grieving, you're going, going through so much, but very rarely do you think about, gosh, you know, my identity is, has been shattered. And um, I know in my, in my situation, uh, because my daughter had a terminal illness, there was lots of drugs at home and machines. And, you know, I was her mother and her carer and her physiotherapist and her advocate and all these things. And then somebody dies and there's silence and all the machines are gone and you're just left. And I think it didn't dawn on me until I read that, that really a part of the crisis of grief, I think, is about identity. Who do you become when you lose somebody that's very, very close to you? So, um, and then I suppose there's the idea of the person grieving just becomes this artifact of memory in society. So people, people stop saying people's names and uh, it's almost like they disappear and somehow you're trying to hold on to them. Um, Slavov Žižek, who is a philosopher, and I can't remember whether he's Slovakian or Slovenian, but um, I'm sure he'll excuse me, uh, conceptualizes mourning as the second killing. That is to say that the easing of the mourning process brings with it a form of infidelity to the loved one. And so while people are, there's kind of, I think, a bit of a conspiracy in society for you to get over it, what you're being asked to do is to actually engage in a second, what feels like a second killing. 
And for me, definitely with the death of a child, it was kind of the antithesis of mothering for me. So it just felt this, I, I was stuck in this kind of uh, inescapable conflict. Um, so a lot of the stuff was very dark that I was reading, a lot of the texts were. And then I came to one of my favorite writers who is Rebecca Solnit mm -hmm. and A Field Guide to Getting Lost, which I would recommend to everybody. And she talked about explorers because I had a sense of I was exploring all this, uh, this concept. And uh, she talks about ex the fact that explorers are always lost because that's what they do. They go out there and they get lost to find something. And I just thought, oh, I really like this. And this felt like sort of a pillar that I could, or a foundation I could use to actually make the work. And um, so I had to put all the texts away a bit, which is my sort of safe place. And then I, except before I did that, I read John Berger and he said, seeing comes before words, the child looks and recognizes before they can speak. And so I knew I would have to shift from this, my sort of like academic, um, quite logical kind of like analytical mind into something that was intuitive, that was beyond words, that I was actually going back into that child place almost. And, um, uh, and actually trusting my intuition um, and really making myself quite vulnerable and taking risks. And that was very, very scary. And um, you, what were the artists you were looking at through this? Uh, well, there was, there was like so many because I just kept looking and looking and looking. But there were a couple that stood out for me, definitely. And they were, um, I suppose, one of them. Well, what I decided as well was that I, I would start trusting my intuition. So things that I felt a real response to immediately, they, they were the things that meant something. I wasn't going to be an analytical about the images. I just think, no, there's something about that and something about that. And these are some of those um, images. So one was um, a painting by Gerhard Richter of his daughter, Betty. And I just love the intimacy of it. And I love that there's a question in it because that's something I wanted to try and put into my own work as well. Um, I just felt that um, there's a gentleness, there's a stillness, but there certainly is a question, um, and I liked that. Another person whose work I really liked was um, Ralph Meteard, who I think is one of the most interesting photographers. He's an American photographer as well, and he used his children a lot to, uh, in his work, and there's something really dark and sinister about his work, and I think it's that sort of juxtaposing of innocence and darkness, and again, I just felt you know, that this work is about darkness, ostensibly. Um, and another piece was um, by the uh, Dutch artist Jan Vep, and it's a painting, an oil painting around 1900, early 1900s of his three sisters. And in my life, I have three really close friends that I love dearly, and they're three young women. And um, uh, I knew I wanted to have those in the project. I knew that they were going to be an important part of the project. So I was looking at... Um, making portraits with three people and somehow this stood out to me and I think it's about there's an austerity but there's a gentleness there's kind of all the things that again aesthetically I suppose I find quite appealing and then I love series so Ronnie Horn is one of my favorite artists and um, her work I suppose um, the whole idea of, of making a series I really like that because I think what that does is it, it demands you enter into a conversation with the artist, even though the artist isn't physically there, because you're looking at images that are similar and you're saying, so why did you do that? What's the difference between that? And actually, um, I think that's really, um, it ends up with sort of a deep looking at the image, because you're really having a conversation with the artist who's not there, but with the artist's work. Um, so a lot of her work, what I really liked was textures, I liked that she could make the Thames, Thames looks just so interesting and also that she uses text and you probably can't see it now but um, in each of those images there's a tiny little, there are several footnotes and then at the end of the images she has text she has written that relate to the footnotes and there's something about that sort of, um, I just loved the combination of those two things so I felt that was something that really interests me. And then Dawn Rowe is the artist at the bottom. And again, it's about a series and it's about repetition. And I find, um, 
you know, why does somebody make an image that looks very like the next one, but there is something different, and what's different? And why do they want me to see this? What's so important? Why are they calling me to this? And that, for me, is there's something, so there's such wealth, I think, in the, that sort of work. So they were my artists, a bit. there were many, but they were the ones that really stood out for me, I suppose. And I mean, I see a big connection with um, the people you're referring to mm -hmm. and the work that you ended uh, you know, producing. Um, do you want to talk and share the, the work, or do we? OK, well, I'm just going to talk a little bit the pro about the process, maybe, first, before you share the work. Is that OK? Yeah, you know, no, no, seriously. OK, yeah, just um, because um, I suppose um, because I'm a researcher, um, in another, I was a researcher in another life. Um, field notes are second nature mm -hmm. to me, and um, uh, so I kept made a lot of field notes. And I kind of, I was really, I really found it very, very difficult. I have to say because I'm relatively new to photography, and I just didn't know. I, like I had some idea in my head that I wanted to make some landscapes, and I was out, you know, with my camera. And I'd look through the camera and I just would think like, I'd look through the, you know, just looking through the viewfinder and I'm thinking, oh, like that's an interest, I like that landscape, but what am I looking at? What, what do I put in the frame? What is this about? And it just was hugely frustrating and I just couldn't make those sort of images. And so I suppose what I started thinking about was, um, well, what kind of images can you make if you can't make those? And I found that actually I could take photographs or make photographs of things that were quite physically close to me. And um, I thought, well, that's the way I have to do it. So that's the process I'm going to engage in with this work. And then I started um, thinking about distance. And there was something so intimidating about the distance. And um, Simone Ville talks about distance. And she says, when, we, when a stranger leaves us, we don't have any, the distance doesn't bother us. But when somebody who loves leaves us, the love is held in the distance. And so I thought, well, maybe I need to be, in the di be comfortable with the distance that I actually can make the images in. And so that was actually, for a lot of my work, it was really close to me. Um, so my eyesight now won't actually allow me to read this, I think. Um, I'll make it up here. Uh, um, so, uh, okay, I mean, so... Well, I mean I looked at text and stuff, actually. I looked, yeah. at, I looked at the language of photography. Mm -hmm. And I looked at things like um, aperture, for example. And um, I was thinking about, like, OK, so I use the aperture as a tool to sort of, like, put, throw more light on the subject or whatever. And then I suppose what was happening was I kept, you know, I was writing all the time and I kept thinking, actually, what I'm doing is actually I'm just shedding the light in my own grief. I'm not talking about any sort of conceptual sort of thing about grief. This is actually about my experience. And so I found using the language of photography to interrogate what was happening for me was really kind of interesting as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so there I was, actually what I was doing was framing, exam examining, and unconsciously unpacking my own grief. Well, I think it's interesting what you say about the physicality of photography, because mm -hmm. I actually think a lot of what you've been trying to do is kind of document the ephemeral, mm. you know, like something that doesn't exist and photography's rule and job is to capture what is seen mm. and you're trying to capture things that you can't be yeah. like, you know, banana, you know, yeah. like um, loss, um, yeah. silence, mm. um, you know, and space and distance mm. and things like that. And I think, um, you know, looking at your, your process, it completes, completely makes sense okay. after working with you because yeah. um, I think... I think, sorry, Mike Guy, I think what you're trying to do is, like, photograph something that doesn't exist. Yes, and I think that was the real struggle, because I am, like, a um, very practical, pragmatic person. So I was jumping into this arena where um, I just was hugely uncomfortable. And I suppose without those artists, there was something, I suppose, and they were the qualities... At the time, I didn't know it, but they were the qualities I was looking for from those artists, I think. Right, yeah, particularly with Richter, with that fuzziness, yeah, you know. Yeah. And it's those kind of things, those little details that I think, you know, are, you know, with the medium and challenging mm -hmm. the medium um, mm -hmm. to depict what isn't seen. Yeah. And I think it's, um, you know, I think you did a great job kind of pushing through it mm. in, in the end, so. Well, it was, um, it was just frustrating and difficult. And also, you know, I remember one day going to Alva and just like putting out images in front of her and just, and I said, Alva, I just want to ask you one question. And she said, okay, I said, are they any good? 
And she said, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I think, you know, and I think it's that, you know, as... I need that you, affirmation. <laughs> you need the affirmation, but you also, you learned how to kind of let go. Yes, yes, that was a big part of it. You know, let go and, yeah. and realize that you're, you're photographing dust or yes. you're photographing, you know, remnants or you're yeah. photographing, and that's, and that's okay. Mm. And, yeah. But, and it's also the, you know, it's, um, I just, it just felt such uncharted territory, I suppose, for me. I was uh, yeah. out there, but that was kind of, uh, so it was, that was definitely an interesting journey, kind of. Mm -hmm. um, and the one thing I wanted to talk about as well was about the physicality of actually making the images, because um, most of my life I've been sort of sitting at a laptop working, and um, uh, what I found was that um, when I would go, I'd come back after a shoot and I was absolutely physically exhausted. Now, I knew there was no kind of, I mean, it didn't, the exhaustion I felt didn't make sense in relation to what I was actually doing, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, That's I was physically. maybe lying on the ground a bit or maybe I had the tripod lower or whatever and it was kind of an awkward position. But I, d I was conscious that I was putting my body in positions that I don't normally put them in. And so I'd come back and I would just be completely wiped out. And if any of you have ever been to a therapist and had a terrible hard session it's that sort of feeling like it was just as if I'd been hit by a truck and then I started reading um, a book called um, The Body Keeps the Score mm. and it's about trauma and it's about working through trauma through actual physical yeah. movement um, and I just felt this was a really something unexpected because it seemed like um, it was just like a transformative you know, I mean, everything isn't fi fixed and great, and I still have grief, but there was something transformative in the process, in the making of the art. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just felt that was just an extraordinary experience, really. Great. So, what, I, what did I want the work to do? Um, so, really, I suppose I wanted, the, I wanted people to know that grief is universal, that everybody in this room is going to um, engage with grief at some stage in their life. It's part of the human condition. Uh, that it's messy, that it's complex, and that it's um, also natural, and that it is a, it's not a linear time-based process where you think, oh, you go through the stages, you're angry, this, that, the other, and then you get to, oh, it's okay, and it's all sorted. It doesn't work like that. Um, and so I suppose, really, I'm challenging, in my work, I'm really challenging the idea of closure again. And I wanted to open up a space because where people could take a look at grief or take a look at what it feels like, I think, because um, there aren't very many spaces where that's allowed. Now, Ireland is probably better than most countries about it, but still it's kind of, you know, there's a time when people, it's kind of, there's an expectation that you're over it or something, so, mm -hmm. yeah. So that's all about my um, process, I mm -hmm. think, and... Um, so then I was going to talk about the work a little bit, um, and just something that kind of struck me, it was struck me this morning actually, um, was that when I was making the work, I just kept finding I would have a single piece or I would have a pair, a single or a pair. Mm -hmm. And there seemed this a rhythm kind of developed, and I was thinking, well, this is like, we're together, I'm on my own, we're together, I'm on my own, which is really, really, the, it kind of mirrors, I suppose, that, that, rhythm of trying of grieving which is about being alive yourself and yet having the person with you and then you know sort of doing that sort of um, uh -huh. rhythm so these are some images i took um down in murloc bay because i really wanted some nature and as you'll notice like they're quite close i had to be quite near them i felt um um there was not a lot to say about the images um the next image is um this one, and I found myself um, photographing women, and um, I found myself photographing sort of like again the, spa the space was getting very short. They're like it was really there was really proximate, I suppose is the word you'd say, and um, and something I suppose that I'm familiar with as well a bit in um, about sort of living with grief is that for a long time I had this sense of I had two words in my head, and it was like looking for, I'm looking for, but I couldn't finish the sentence. And I think there is that thing of like you are searching and um, I hope some of that has actually come into the work as well. Um, and this one, I suppose, I, it was an image and I just really wanted that sort of postcard size. 
Um, and I felt that it made me think of the body and the landscape of the body and the scars and the marks on the body through, I suppose, the uh, carrying the grief. Um, like the corpus of the body, right? Yeah. And these are, these are two images. You probably can't see, um, see them now, but um, what I was photographing really was dust and just that sense of, like, you're, of waiting and looking. Um, and again, you've got my two images together. And I just found that the colour was coming into them a bit, um, uh, but I also wanted to interrupt that. And um, I suppose this is it. these images, these parts are influenced by uh, very much by uh, Ralph Meteart, Meteart. And it was um, they're just sort of like five by six, and I uh, printed them on architect's paper. And the idea is in the gallery space that they would actually be. Um, a, there would be a branch suspended in the gallery and these would um, be suspended like in catgut or whatever from the, the branch. And there was so, so there's movement in them. So there's almost a play at the kind of innocence of um, a, a child's mobile that they hang over their cot. Also capturing the wind. And, uh, yes. Yeah. You know, again, evidence of yes. you know, something that you can't see. Yes, and it's also interrupting, it's interrupting the wall as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I quite like the idea of that, you know. Yeah. Um, and then because I became a little bit more adventurous and uh, less restricted, I started making marks because I felt that um, somehow I just was going with my intuition. I thought, I'm not going to judge these things. I'm just going to make them. And I made work that I actually really liked myself. I was really happy with it because um, it felt very, I suppose, almost primordial in some ways, some of the marks did. And uh, so I was really kind of happy about them. Yeah, really, you know, almost performative, you know, the yes. body and the, again, this, you know, making evidence. Yes. Yeah. You know, versus an, you know, an image, you know. Yes, and I think as well that um, that the camera wasn't, some of the work, like the camera wasn't between me mm -hmm. um, and the subject. So there was something about that or, you know, the footprints is, uh, it was a workshop I did in the Glucksman Museum in Cork. Mm -hmm. And um, it was um, really, it was a drawing workshop. And, but, you know, it was just charcoal and lots of paper and absolutely sort of really dirty. It was just wonderful. Mm -hmm. And just, just the footprints just seemed very evocative of, I suppose, that um, I, don't, I don't want to use the metaphor of the journey. <laughs> yeah. But... Uh, um, and so I think the work resolves itself in the, in the two final pieces for me. And one is, this one is called Borrowed Daughters, and uh, that's what they are. They are my borrowed daughters, and they're Evie, Eva, and Emer. And um, uh, they are very present in my life, and they have, a very, they have a very strong presence in my life. And so that feels like one part of the resolution and then the other part of the re re resolution is the absence. And this is the image in the gallery. It's the absence of my daughter. And I suppose that, in as much as I could, sort of um, resolved the work. Yeah, and I, I remember when, particularly the portrait, that was kind of a turning point. With yes. The three. That was um, kind of all these different things that were floating around. You, you gained a lot more confidence yeah. when, you, when, you, when you came in with that. Yeah. Yeah. And all these other kind of pieces fell into place. So yeah, um, and also just the process as well. In that, one of them lives in Germany, one lives in um, Belfast, and one lives in uh, West Cork. So the fact that the three of them came together, they didn't know each other. Mm. They knew of each other, and so that was a really, um, it was a quite an emotional day, really. Um, but really, really lovely, and it just felt like something something was resolved in the making of that image as well. Okay. So that's the and the other image, the one with the chair is. Um, I don't know, you can't see it. Uh, the chair is. Um, this is an image of a chair. It's uh, very dark. I think I might have pulled something out there. Maybe did I? No. No, it's, it's okay. You're seeing dark, it. It's, very it's a dark. very dark image. Yeah. It's a very dark image, and really, it's an image of a chair uh, in a in a background where there are lots of black. So it's re you know theatre black. So it's really dark, and I just have um, uh, it's a, a red velvet cloak that my daughter used to pay dressing up with, and that's just I've just that draped on the chair, and that's just I suppose um, the presence of her absence. Mm -hmm. And the very final thing I wanted to do was just um, 
maybe, I don't know if I can read this, if I can see it, but it's just a piece of text I wrote. Um, and so I did a lot of writing in the process. And I suppose for me, in some ways, this kind of, this feels like a way to um, uh, maybe bring things together in, in, in the text. Mm -hmm. uh, so if I can do that now. Um, okay, along the way, I, there's absolutely no way I can read it there, I think. Along the way, I looked, uh, no, just got to think if I can actually enlarge it in any way. Uh. Or maybe I can read it from here. Yeah, yeah. Along the way, I looked to my const constellation of companions to untangle the complexity of the process I had embarked on. So often, in the latter stages of this work, I was reminded of Jacques Derrida's words on the death of his friend, Paul de Man. If we have, as one says in French, l'amour dans l'âme, death in the soul, it is because from now on we are destined to speak of Paul de Man instead of speaking to and with him. Interestingly, Derrida admits to continuing his conversation with de Man after his death the end of the conversation being too difficult, maybe a rejection of the modern concept of closure. And while I speak of Rian, I also speak to her and with her. This is the mystery of absence and presence. Is this what Derrida means by gedaxness? A thinking, externalizing memory that gives us over to writing and thought in a future-orientated engagement with the dead. Is this work not just that, more than memory? It is energy, creativity, and love. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> so with that, do we have any questions for Michelle? Uh, just a question about, um, you said, about grief not being a linear mm. process, and it's, I'm just curious how you married um, being on a course with a very linear trajectory and with deadlines and, you know, an end date, how you married the process with the actual course? Um, really well, because I really like, um, um, I suppose there's a part of me that is just so, um, that responds so well to deadlines. And I think that what, what I've learned actually in, one of the things I've learned in my life is that if you, a lot of the time just thinking about the work doesn't make anything happen. It's actually once you start engaging and doing and making and rejecting, that for me then things started happening. So I think I liked that there was kind of an expectation that it would produce something at certain dates because it kept the pressure on me, which I could have sort of like been waxing lyrical at home quite easily. Well, and to add to that, I think this is just one output that Michelle's using to look at grief. So I think it's, you know, even though the MFA is, you know, uh, got a finite timeline, I think in her greater trajectory, it's just kind of one more different way of working. I mean, cause yeah. I think, um, you know, the writing and even the types of writing that you've done over the last two years mm -hmm. while making images, while mm -hmm. making marks, while mm -hmm. making all these different things, you know, I expect to talk to you, you know, in six months and you're, I don't know, doing something completely different mm. with, you know, and I think that's what makes, I think that's what makes the project so rich is that you are so, it's not because no one wants to question mm. you because grief is so personal, mm. but it's just that you have thought about your kind of role and your, and your thoughts about everything within the project so thoroughly that I think it's, you know, it's, that's what gives it its greatness. Okay. Thank you. And not that it's, you know, um, I don't think people are scared to yeah. talk about grief with you yeah. because you are very confident mm. in multiple ways of looking at it. Yeah. I think there's something as well, and I just think just kind of going back in a way to what you were saying there about your question, like I'm really conscious of time. Like I think people don't know they're going to die. I know I'm going to die. And I just think I need, there's an awful lot I want to do before then. Um, whereas, like, if I'm if I was thirty something or twenty something, I probably wouldn't be that <laughs> have that sense of um, uh, drive. I think, and also there's something about I've lived a life, you know. So, um, 
Yes, yeah, so then it's about actually, for me, I think that, uh, and I, I suppose going back to when I was, um, you know, looking after my daughter who, you know, was physically incapacitated a lot of the time. I had a lot of time for thinking then, and I just think there's something about it. I feel this is the time for action in my life. Um, okay. And um, I wish I just had the energy I had when I was in my 30s, but anyway, I do my best. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the question. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, hi, um, online audience. So first of all, this question is from Laura Aguiar. Mm -hmm. And Laura, you can let me know how badly I mispronounce it, your, your surname there. Hi, Laura. <laughs> um, she says, fantastic work by Michelle, very personal and very moving. I like the way she printed, framed the images differently and to hear more about the process behind it. I wonder how does she feel now after completing her work and seeing it in the gallery space? Um, well, I suppose the... Um I've just, I've just framed two pieces, I suppose. That's the first thing to say. But, um, I mean, I would absolutely love to print all the work. And because scale is a big part of the work as well, um, and I really would love to print it, and um, maybe someday I will be lucky enough to show it. Um, and a lot of it is actually, I, I sort of imagine a lot of it is sort of is vinyl on the wall, a lot of the very big images, like the domestic kind of images. But... Um, and I also would see the see them having see text as well. Um, it was a bit of a challenge uh, for me printing the um, um, the one of the images here because actually it's very dark. But the near it depends on where you stand because of the paper as to whether you see the full image or not. Um, and I have to thank John Rush for his extraordinary patience in in printing that. So that's I suppose one part of the question. How do I feel about it on the wall? I'm absolutely delighted. I feel it's a real privilege. Um, really delighted to be in Belfast Exposed. And um, yeah, I just am really looking forward to the next bit of work. That's great. And there's actually another question here, and it's from Rob Stead. Great presentation, Michelle. It sounds like the process of creating the images wasn't as important as the images mm. themselves. Did it help, therefore, to forget how people would interpret them? Um, what, what's the last bit of the question? Did it help? So the actual question part yeah. at the end was, did it help, therefore, to forget how people would interpret them? So did you? Yeah. Did you, you know, thanks, Rob. Um, thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, so it was almost like, um, you know, performative action. Oh, sorry, Mike Guy. Yeah. You know, did, did, did that kind of, did you think about the viewer? Oh, no, not at all. There you go. Not at all, no. Yeah. Um, and definitely, like, the performative element, I really like that, and I just think that I would like to incorporate more of that in my work, I think. No influence by me. <laughs> From the audience. Um, did you find there was much more freedom in your intuitive work than something you'd set out to plan to do, which freed you more. Um, Thank you. I think this, uh, like just going back to that quote about John Berger, I have learned to not trust my intuition. I think this is what mm. society does for us, and I had learned not to trust my intuition, to trust my head. Mm. And until I started trusting my intuition, I just think the work was kind of going nowhere in ways. And I mean, I don't want. I don't think you stop trusting. You start trusting your head. You start trusting your heart and yes, your guts. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because I think, yes, because, um, you know, I, I worked with you very, you know, a lot over the last year, and it was, I, I found, you know, I, I love working with you, but I found you're very much rooted in your research, mm. which is great, yeah. but, you know, very much, you know, holding on to that, and then when you were able to let go and mm. go with your gut, yeah. like that, like that uh, portrait was mm. a turning point, and then just these, just these marks and yeah. these different things you know and it um it kind of made the process of making joyful yes i have become so excited about <laughs> and i had um <clears throat> uh, I, I had this kind of uh, um narrative in my head that i can't make things mm -hmm. and that you weren't good enough yes that i wasn't good enough to make things so the I'd... camera was limiting you and your <laughs> knowledge of it <laughs> exactly 
exactly. Yeah. We all are, it was all too complicated <laughs> for me. And so it's really just about, um, and I found that like how you do something is by doing it. That's one of the greatest pieces of learning in my whole life. And I'm just thinking about Lucy, who's here, who taught me how to make wonderful books. So I have, uh, um, you know, it's just, I, I, I did a class with Lucy and I just thought, I ended up with a book that actually looks like a real book. I can't believe I made that. And it's just that thing of like doing the thing, you know, taking the risks, definitely. Yeah, and I, and I think in particularly in an MFA program when you're in a group of, of people who are image mm. makers, mm. you know, finding that more process-oriented yeah. confidence yeah. is, you know, it, I mean, it's, it's not just Belfast, it's around the world, yes. you know, trying to be, um, you know, kind of like, the, the Dalmatian in a herd of poodles. You know, it's like, how do you um, find your voice? And, yep. and you could see that joy when you were making it and that yep. confidence building. And it was really beautiful to watch. I, yep. mean, I really loved it. And it was, it, it, it was just, it was a wonderful experience, really. And um, I'm just really excited about making more and, and maybe, and being more. And I know it's something you would have really encouraged, Haley, and I just thank you about that for this. Um, doing more than just making the image, you know, um, actually being a bit more experimental and stuff like that. So that's really, really looking forward to that. Good. Okay. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Any okay. other questions? Or is that like more? a... It might be a perfect ending. Thanks very much. Thank you.